God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I have um I'm gonna ask something that I do not normally do. But um first let me all start off by saying that I understand what I'm about to say. I have a daughter who is in the Netherlands. But because she's in the Netherlands, she has never stopped being my daughter. Uh, I have children there in Germany and in and, and Denton and Denison, and that, but the space has not ceased them from being part of our family. We have some folks here that come into our church and for different reasons had to move away. They had to come back recently, but we're still I don't feel any different yet. I don't feel any, any less a part of our families when we're here. But a tragedy occurred. Uh, we had asked for prayers last week for a baby that was born. Unfortunately, the baby uh, has gone to the Lord. I don't normally do this. But I need... <clears throat> Excuse me, I need you to understand, I need them to understand that their love. You all else, God loves them. I want to ask the Owens family if y'all would all come up. And when they get up here, I would like parents, mothers, fathers, grandparents, we'd like to surround them in prayer for them, if you don't mind. I don't know, I mean, the whole family. <laughs> the whole family come up, please. Let's come up, let's surround them with them. God is love, and we need to pray for them. Yards, put it into your mask and it blew warm air. 
in the middle of winter, we take that hose and stick it up in our shirt. That's what I'm going to do here to stand up like this. Um, I've been reading Ezekiel for uh, a while now. And uh, this week while I was at the hospital, I was asked, why, why do this? Why, why do I, when I go to the hospitals and visit those that are in, in need, why do I, I mean, you drive what was it, an hour and a half, two hours to that hospital in, in traffic? Because, you know, everybody knows I love Dallas traffic. That is just, that's my love with Dallas traffic. Which is why BJ don't let me go on when I drive in Dallas. But why do I do it? Well, I come to church, drive an hour and come to church and preach. Well, why do I go here and there and everywhere for, for people who sometimes don't even want me there, sometimes don't even like me? And I'll tell you why. Because God said so. There is nothing that I can do that God has not already either told me to do or told me not to do. Everything in my life, even when I mess up and do what I'm not supposed to, God has been there. And usually while I'm doing it, I know I'm about to get spanked. I can tell you that already. It's like, man, I know this is going to hurt. Um, and I know you all might have scored sometimes, but I remember um, I was riding in, in southwest Oklahoma, riding horses for a guy, Colts. And there's a nice, big, big horse, not nice, big building. And, and he was a four-year-old. We saddled him up, and you know, we had to kind of tie that up to saddle him up. And we're going to let him run it around the arena a little bit. We got to remember that sucker, and he went straight up in the air. And he squealed and bucked and kicked, and he was getting all four feet off the ground. And I was sitting there thinking, hmm, this is going to hurt. God only knew anyway, but knew it was going to be painful. And I've done that my whole life, it seems like. You know, you look at something and God says, don't do that. And you do. But those aren't the good times of why I do what I do. God says, I need you to go over here. And I go. And people say, you know, you gave us such a blessing. No, I received it. I feel God every time I go to visit someone, every time I come to church, every time I every time I breathe, it seems like that, that I feel the power of God. So I was reading Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3, 16. Sorry, 16. Ezekiel 3, starting with 16. I'll give you all a chance to turn there. This is when Ezekiel had just seen a vision, a vision of God. And uh, God was talking to him. He was overwhelmed. God told him to go to Israel, and he took him to the exiles in Israel in the Tel Aviv. And and, and he made him sit there for seven days. Now understand, Ezekiel was a little upset with God, and he did not want to go. He was a little upset. But he went in, well, he didn't have a choice. God took him in. So starting in verse 16, he said, At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak. And give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil. 
in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. His righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn him, of one righteous man, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took your warning and you will have saved yourself. This is where God was telling you, you're going, I, I didn't ask you to do this, I'm telling you, you're going to be a watchman over Israel. Now, a watchman, if any of you have ever uh, there's a whole lot of them, not just the military, but there's other jobs. They used to have uh, people that would stand in towers, uh, and they would watch. They would stand on guard, and they would watch for, for messengers, or they would watch for enemy, or they would watch for something to happen that they needed to warn the town. And they would stand and watch. It was their responsibility for the protection of the town, protection of the city. If they didn't warn anybody and the enemy came over the walls, everybody was either put to the sword or made slave or something, but, but they didn't have a chance to defend themselves. God appointed Ezekiel. He said, if you're going to do this, I'm not asking you want to, man, I'm telling you, you're going to do this. You will warn people if I tell you to. And if you don't, it's your head. You're going to be held accountable. First thing is why would God ask Ezekiel when he didn't want to do it? God appointed him because he set him aside from from. A long time ago, God came to him because he knew he had the moral courage to do this. And he told him a little bit later, he said, he said, don't worry about what they say to you. Don't worry about what they say about you. I will make your head as hard as flint. They will not touch you. He had no choice. It was a calling. In the New Testament, in uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8, 16, 9, 16. I'm looking at all kinds of numbers. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians and, and explaining that, that he was an apostle, not because of choice, but because Christ came to him on the road to Damascus. Remember the story? Christ came to him and said, Why do you persecute me? An interesting fact about that story, when Christ knocked him on his knees and said, Saul, why do you, why do you persecute me? The first thing he said, Who are you, Lord? But you didn't know already, right? And then he told uh, Ananias, he said, I want you to go and I want you to touch him and pray over him and, and, and his eye, heal his eyes because I want him to know the things he will do for me. I want to know him, what he will suffer for me to the Gentiles. So Paul was also appointed. He was called. And in verse 16 he says, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I've said it a lot of times when people talk about the sermons, I say, it's not me that preaches this. I've tried preaching a sermon before. It didn't work out. But when God does it, when God 
picks a person up, puts them on a stage or on a hay bale or, or in a big tabernacle or in a mega church, God puts them there and says, you speak. They do it. A little bit later, Ezekiel. Of course, I didn't write this down on my notes, but I'm kind of real quick. Um, a little later in Ezekiel, uh, in 24, he said, uh, When the Spirit came unto me and, I, and raised me to my feet, he spoke to me and said, Go shut yourself inside your house. You, son of man, that will tie with ropes. You will be bound so that you cannot go among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the root of your mouth so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them. Though they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Whoever will listen, let them listen. And whoever will refuse, let them refuse. For they are a rebellious house. When he told, when he told Ezekiel he's going to send him to Israel, he told him, he said, uh, I'm going to send you to uh, I'm going to send you to Israel. To the exiles. He said, I'm going to send you to a people that, that doesn't speak a foreign tongue. They don't have a different culture. I'm sending you to your people. People that you are used to. You're part of them. You grew up with them. I'm sending you there. And when you speak my words, they will know that a prophet has been among them. He said, I'm sending you to a, a rebellious and evil nation. Why? Why would you send someone that has been rebelling against you, that has, has followed other gods, has I've done it, why would you send them, send them a uh, savior? Why would you send them someone to help them? Why when when your child has left home at 16, lived on the streets, and and Addicted to drugs and prostituting themselves out for this stuff and, and all these things. Why would you go and try to rescue them from that? Because you love them. God sent Ezekiel to the people of Israel who were rebelling against him, who hated him, who prostituted themselves out to different gods because he loved them. He put them. <laughs> PJ and I were talking about this before. And we're going to go through this and find out how many times, how many years did Israel actually follow God? How many years were they actually getting beat up by God because they didn't follow Him? I said, that's a pretty easy task. All we have to do is start in, in uh, King, uh, Judges and go through 2 Chronicles. And we'll find out exactly how many years. Because each reign, even it said either he followed the ways of David, of his father David, or it says he did not follow the ways of his father before him. And did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's how you know. But God beat him up, and when he had, had enough spanking, he loved on him. He sent him a savior. And he loved him again. Or I'll say again, he loved on him again. Because he always loved him. Sometimes you gotta show tough love. So he sent Ezekiel. He appointed him, just like he told Paul, you're gonna do this. And Paul went. Paul got thrown into jail because of his pride. Paul got Paul got beat up a lot. I mean, he died a prisoner of Rome. But still, he followed God. Now, I will tell you this. I came up here 
and I preached a sermon that I wanted to preach and did not consult God, did not listen to Him, I believe my career as a pastor would be finished. At least for a while. Because God wouldn't take it. I know that I resigned from a church because of my pride. And I resigned from a church. And God tried to tell me, okay, we were driving to church the day I was going to resign and our car broke down and I couldn't make it there. PJ was saying, no, maybe you don't need to do this. No, I'm going to do it. Set my mind. I've got, my mind is made up. Next Sunday, we get another vehicle. And we're heading there. We got a flat. Jack it up, fix the flat, and head on in. God told me twice. Don't do this. And I did. Never again. <laughs> that is the worst spanking I've ever gotten. And I don't like it. So never again. Now when God says, you say this, I say it. I'm telling you all of this because I want you to understand something. God told his apostles, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go, make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them the commands that I have given you. And I will be with you to the end of the world. I want you to remember this. God said, go and make, he didn't say, listen, if you don't mind while you're out there, talk to a few people about me. No, he said, Get up, go, and make disciples of all nations. God has made each of us. If we have accepted Christ as our Savior, if we have, have given our life to God, God has made each of us a watchman. Don't care if you're six years old. I don't care if you're 90 years old. God has made us a watchman. And when God says, you know what? Go to that person and talk to them. I really don't want to do this, God. Didn't ask that, did I? Go to this person and talk to them. And you go and you talk to them. And it's easy to start talking about God. You know that thing about don't talk about politics and religion? I've never grasped that. I talk about them both. <laughs> But you should start out with religion. And I've had a few, few people say, you know what? I don't believe in you. I don't believe in your God. And you know what I say? Well, God bless you, I'll pray for you. And I'll leave it at that. Do I get in an argument with them? No. No. The Bible says it in Proverbs. I haven't got that verse in my head. I can find it. But I will paraphrase in today's language. The Bible says, do not argue with a fool because he will drag you down to his level and beat you with experience. Pretty much sums it up. So you don't argue with them. You show them, you argue with them by the way you live. I don't believe in your God. Well, you know what? God bless you. Hope you got good fire insurance. But, mine's out of this world, by the way. Uh, but, God has made us, God has, has commissioned us to go. Now, after we talk to them, after we talk to them and explain to them about the salvation, about, about the love of God, about how He says, Son of Christ died on the cross for us. We need to teach you to pray. If you're here today and you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, if you've never actually started a relationship with Jesus Christ, 
I don't want you to pray with me now. Lord, I know I've done wrong. I admit that I'm a sinner. Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to live in this world a perfect life, to die on the cross for my sins. I confess it today as my Savior. Lord, I ask you, God, me in this world, teach me what you have, have me to do. Bring me right up into heaven and leave this world. I ask the saints in your name. Amen. That's all you need to do is say a prayer like that. You don't have to say the same words, but you have to believe in your heart. Today, we're going to celebrate the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. We're going to celebrate and say, what well, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say a blessing and as in how these guys passed out, well, I'm telling you a story. Lord, ask you to forgive me my sins, Lord, so I can stand before you pure. Lord, lift up this holy suffer, Lord, that, that you have given us to, to break, to break the bread, drink the cup. Lord, I pray that you just bless us our bodies and our bodies your service. I ask you to bless the ones that are serving it, the ones that have prepared it. And Lord, I pray a blessing on every one of the us. That's the same in your name. Amen. Christ gathered with the... Go ahead. Christ gathered in the, in the upper room the day before he was sacrificed. And he said, I long to have a supper with you. Eat this Passover meal. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. That's broken for me. And he took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it around. And he said, This is my blood of the, the new covenant that is shed for me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to think about something. We're doing this in remembrance and to honor Christ and his sacrifice. If you have a, a, a stain of sin on you, if you have something against your brother or your sister or your cousin or your uncle twice removed, it doesn't matter. If you have something against someone else, you right now ask God to forgive you for that. And you go to this person afterwards for you. You ask forgiveness. Or you give forgiveness if it's needed. Do not do this. It's staying on your sin, on your soul. Are we all served? We all good? Well, I guess it didn't take long to serve because nobody knew it's here. A lot of the old ones have gone away. We've got two coming back in. Disciples, you know, go and make disciples and get them in the church. So, next week, or the next week, bring somebody else. And know your wife or your husband doesn't count. Your children don't count. Bring somebody new. We're good? Alright, let's ask a blessing on this. And I'm going to give y'all a chance to pray, ask forgiveness, and then I'll ask for a prayer. Lord, I thank you for asking forgiveness for our falling short, as I know each one of us has. Lord, if there's anything in my life, or search me and look for something that is not keeping me from me. I pray that you put it out of my heart, out of my mind, Lord. 
Akura asks you, does this code mean robotics and abolish your service? She's in a prayer. Mm -hmm. 